Passover. This used to be the second highest holiday in the church. It used to be uh, uh, right after Easter, the biggest, uh, the biggest celebration of the church, but uh, not so much anymore. But it's still an important day. We're going to be talking about, about Pentecost. We're going to be talking about what that means. We're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. You know that the Lutheran church is really big on Jesus. We talk a lot about Jesus. But not every church has that much focus on Jesus. The, the Presbyterian, the Calvinist churches tend to talk a lot more about God the Father. They talk about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but they focus on God the Father. And then those, those crazy Pentecostals, they're always talking about the Holy Spirit. It kind of freaks us out because I mean, this, this is, it's, it's a little, I don't know that. The, the Holy Spirit as well as, and we just don't focus that much on it. So we're going to be doing that a little bit today. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to tell a story. It's so funny. And Jan's going to talk in a second. But Jan was at our first service. You know, we kind of come in to worship, and we set our minds up, and the pastor gets up there to preach, and says, okay, we unlock our right side of our brain, and we say, okay, I'm, I'm going to listen to this, this presentation. And today, it was not a presentation, it was a story. And I could just see our people like, what's he doing? What's he doing? There's, there's no place in my brain for a story here today. We, we get kind of conditioned. And so, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so you're going gonna, gonna to have to use a different part of your brain today to listen to our sermon, okay? I'm just warning you up front since they kind of freaked out for a sermon. Jan was part of that. They didn't really freak out about it. So, Jan, thanks for coming back. Um, Jan and I were part of a, uh, an event last week that was really inspiring. Our district met, and I wanted Jan, to, she was our representative, and I wanted her to come and just share uh, a, a couple moments about what she heard at our conference and what her thoughts of, about that gathering were. Jan, would you... Churches that don't have pastors, 
And so the really big church and people in our churches are lay people to become licensed deacons so that they can hold church services. Wouldn't it be neat if we had somebody who would say, I would like to do this, I'd like to go over to another part of Merced and start a Spanish congregation. Wouldn't that be neat? So we can do that, and it's something that's going to be encouraged by our district. So I've got a great big book that if anybody wants to read it, it's got all the information about the convention, the really interesting stuff. But go where the people are, and be joyfully Lutheran, like this book says. And this is really interesting. I'd love to share it with people because it's got some really good stuff in it. I was able to have dinner with Pastor Koo. He was there representing the uh, seminary. And so it was neat to see him. Pastor Ish and his wife were there. So it was nice to see them. And they look well and healthy. healthy. So it was a, a good convention. So enjoy it. Thank you for having me go. Thanks again, Jan. We just appreciate you being here representing us. You know, we, we talked, Jan was talking a little bit about the, the state of, of, of the church, Lutheran church being very typical of, of most of our mainline churches, of, of most of Christian, Christianity in this country. Fifty years ago, you built a church. And all these people came and just showed up. 20, uh, 1990, I was in Brentwood with, with, Mike, with Mike Wang. He was our pastor. I was just a lay, lay guy at that time. But we built a church and we, we were able to reach into the community and talk church and talk values and talk uh, programs and people. We could, we could help them come. Today, it's a lot harder to build a church and there are a lot of people that say, I'm never going to church. What is a church? Or why would people go to a church? Who was, who was that Jesus, Moses, Abraham guy, right? They're all the same, or they're different? I mean, people just don't know nothing these days. So it's, it's very interesting. It's a very different world to be doing church in. And so this idea of the lay minister, the idea of pastors helping lay people be the ministers, be, reach, be, be the ones who reach out to the people that you know and be the face of Christ. That's it. We are about enabling each other to reach into the world. The pastor is not the only one that gets to do that. It's something that is joyfully known by, by everybody. So I'm all about that. We are going to, we're going to be all about helping our, our lay people connect into the world. It's very exciting. It's really, it was a very, very positive conference. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Hey, next, uh, next July, or June, June 3rd, not next week, but two weeks from now, we're not having this worship service. I told you that last week. We're not having this worship because after the 845 service, we're all going to go into the parish hall, and we're going to have a meeting about the, the, the upcoming construction on this campus, the new, new uh, playground and the new entryway and what all that means. So don't come to church at 10 30, expect the church, but to come, come expecting this meeting. Now i got to tell you a story. Monday morning I showed up from Greek kids at school and up couples in this car with these two little kids, a preschooler and a second grade, I think. And it's Matt Migliazzo. Matt is the guy. He's the contractor who's going to be running our crazy amount of building around here. And he, we're standing there and he's just talking about the stuff we're going to do. And then he turns to, to this building and he says, See that up there? That is just rotten. I sent a guy up there to look at that and said, that's rotten, we got to fix that. And I said, there's a roof thing on it. He's describing all this construction stuff. That's rotten, and we got to rip that one out. i got a bid for that, and that's a really good bid. We're going to figure out what they get. New windows. I'm, you know what? i got the windows. It's not going to cost us any money for the windows, because I, I mean, it's like, whoa. And then he says, can we do this like this week? Could I start this week? I, I, I don't even know. I, I, said, I, I went around and got all these pictures of other buildings in Turlock that are the sort of colors that I think would look really good here. Like, really good? I'm like, I don't even know. So give me 48 hours. He said, you know what? I want to get, get going on this right away. And I want to start with the church. Because you know, I bring my kids here and they, you guys take care of our family. And I want to take care of this family. He wants to start with the church. I mean, all the places he's going to make money over there, you know, that's what's profitable for him. This is not going to make any money over here, but he wants to do it. And he wants to get going. So tomorrow morning he's going to be here with his team, and they're going to look at what to tear down and what to put. 
He's going to have some colors up there, so we're going to have a lot of conversations about this. But this is happening now. And he is so excited. God has sent us an amazing, talented, capable guy who is excited about his church, his family. doesn't even go here. He's a Catholic. He, he doesn't even go here. But this is his family. That's awesome. That is God working in the community of his believers to do stuff. So we are beneficiaries of that. Hey, I'm leaving here. I've got to run from here to the airport. I'll be gone. I'll be back until Tuesday night. I've got to stay close for a couple of days and do some business back there. So if anybody needs me, I'm on my phone and Carolyn knows how to get hold of me. Check your bulletin. We have a lot of stuff going on this week. Graduations and end of school stuff. We do not have a congregational meeting. I don't know how that got in there, but we do not have a congregational meeting today. And scratch that. And if you'd like to be a reader, sign up for it. We have places in the parish hall to do that. I would love to have you do that since I'm doing all the reading today and it's getting longer and longer. These things are getting very long. And we are God's people. We are gathered to know Him, to be a part of His community. Let's take a moment and say good morning and wish God's peace to each other. perfection, 
and we forgive you, and we're just giving you an excuse to be imperfect. That's the pressure the world is putting on us right now. You better be perfect, or there's not a place for you. That stinks. That's hard. And that's not the way we're built. And God knows that. Because we are basically broken people. We may try as hard as we can, but we are going to not be perfect. We as Christians know that. And we get to walk out of here today having heard not that it's okay that we're all broken, but that we're okay in God's eyes. Not that we should be acting broken, but when we do, we are truly, totally forgiven for that. And we are changed. And we can offer that same grace to others who are living in brokenness. So let's hear those words today of forgiveness after we speak our admission that we too are broken people. Let's speak those words together. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if, but if we, we confess, confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Let's take a moment to just reflect on that brokenness which we find ourselves in. Lord, the world around us demands perfection, demands appropriateness as they define what is right, demands that we are something that we just cannot be because we are indeed broken and we can't help it. But Lord, we are cracked and you fill in our cracks. We are scraped and you heal us. We are confused and you straighten us. Lord, our brokenness is a part of who we are and you accept that and you hold us and you mold us and we find ourselves no longer broken, but perfected. Lord, thank you for the perfection you give us. Thank you for taking that brokenness and handing it to your son. We are grateful for that great exchange. May we celebrate and live in that forgiveness and share it with others who trespass against us. We are people who are broken no longer. We are people whose sin no longer belongs to us. You are no longer caught in that. For you are changed and transformed as a called and ordained pastor of the word, as somebody given these words to share with you, they are directly from Jesus. Your sin is forgiven. Totally, fully, entirely. Praise be to God. You are new. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Readings today come from uh, a variety of sources. This is classic Ezekiel reading. Anybody who saw, who saw my stole the first the first service, I'm wearing a stole around my neck. For those of you who have been in the first service, I have these images from Ezekiel, a vision he has of uh, that are part of the uh, part of 
his vision of who, who God is and how God came to him. But today we hear a reading from, the, from, from Ezekiel about his vision of the Spirit at work. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out of the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones, and he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am Lord. So I prophesied that I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone. And as I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from the graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from the graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land that you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Our second reading is from the book of Acts. This is the actual story. Acts is just such a great book. It's such a great history book of what happened in the early church. And this is the story of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound that was like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. It divided tongues as they fire appeared to them, and rested in each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native tongue? Parthians, Medes. Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. 
For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only a, they're in the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders to the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes. The great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Kind of a dramatic picture, isn't it? Our gospel comes from the book of John, and I invite you to uh, stand. Not because we are supposed to stand, but because it's our custom to stand. Long story for those of you who've been in that conversation with me. And Jesus said, when the Helper comes, who will I will send to, to you from the Father? The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. Now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I did not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Oh uh -huh. 
is in pure good. So we, we, we know, we're, we're pretty comfortable with that. Describe God the Father. Where do we see God the Father? Those, those, are, those words probably apply as well. Anything different? Where do we see God in, in Scripture? Everywhere, okay, that's good. Thank you, God. You know, we see in the fact that we see powerful images. You know, the people crossing the Red Sea, there's a big pillar of fire, right? You know, there's times when people see, like, the backside of God. If you know, Moses, right? So the backside of God is, like, base. It starts glowing. And it's, so God the Father is kind of scary again. How do you describe the Spirit? Describe the Holy Spirit. What's that? A dove. Yes, yes, okay, that's right. Now that is the only time that we really see the Spirit kind of physically, personally manifested. And, it, and he just represents, yeah, he, he's, he's a dove, he kind of represents. It's kind of a weird one. That's, that's, when Jesus gets baptized, the, the dove comes down representing the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay, that one aside, because that's, that's an anomaly. How else do we, thank you, Mosley. Through that's your contribution for today. How else do we hear or uh, see the Spirit? We don't really, I mean, this is kind of the answer I would expect. We don't really have a good handle on the Spirit, but there are some characteristics of the Spirit. There are some things that are a little bit different about. God is one. Three persons, one God, three faces, three parts, three. Not a weird thing, this trinity. But God is one, but there are three aspects to God, and they all are a bit different. The Holy Spirit is the one we know the least about, but there are some characteristics. I want you to listen to this story, and I want you to think about what you're hearing in the Spirit. What you're hearing in this story, it tells you who the Holy Spirit is. The sun rose on a cool spring day at the edge of the frontier. A number of the travelers were already awake in anticipation because the big day was here. Finally, the carts were packed, the horses rested, goodbyes had been said. And after a blessing by the local minister and a big breakfast of pancakes and bacon, the wagon train would be leaving. Jed Johnson, the leader, smiled as he looked at the clear skies and the warming wind, and he sensed good fortune with him. Johnson, who liked to be called Colonel, was the guy who was going to lead these people on their new lease on life. Under his charge were families, kids, older folks, individuals, parents, lost souls, adventurers, all eager to build a new life in place in the territory they'd been hearing about for years, and he would take them there. Sketches of their destination were pleasing, and the reports were glowing. And this land, known as Happy Valley, would be where this sprawling group would make their home. So soon they saddled up their horses and headed off, not into the unknown, but into, to the lesser known. They were excited, they were confident, and they were ready for their new life. Now, the first few days of their journey were pretty uneventful. They ran into a few people who greeted them and encouraged them. But travel soon became a little bit more demanding. Eventually, they found themselves clawing their way up a mountain pass to the top of a mountain where a decision was going to have to be made. Because before them, there were two trails, and they diverged. On the right was a, a steep, challenging, and treacherous road with boulders and cliffs and very little tree cover. In the far distance, they could see the trail winding through a, a treeless mountain and then up on its side, but the mountain was covered in clouds and they could see no more. The colonel knew that getting his people down this pass and that area would be a challenge. To 
The left, however, was a much different road. It was wider, it was smoother, it was shaded with water, clearly abundant. And this road seemed, seemed very consistent with what they knew and expected in Happy Valley. So after consulting with his lieutenants, the colonel decided to pursue this road. And they called it Sweet Canyon. And the people gladly followed. So they pursued miles of this inviting canyon, and occasionally uh, they met a, a nomad who would accompany them for the next few days. None of these travelers knew of Happy Valley, but they said it sounded promising, and they encouraged them to continue. Now one day, a man with long hair and a red shirt appeared on the edge of camp. He was, he was quiet, and he was unassuming kept to himself, and spent just a few days listening, smiling pleasantly when waved at. After a few days, if you looked up and you caught his eye, he, he was welcoming people with open arms, saying, come sit and visit for a while. And a few people actually did. Around that time, Malachi Smith's wagon broke an axle, and he was quickly underneath it, fixing it. Little Beth Simmons took to a fever, and he showed her mother where to find teas and herbal remedies in the area. One evening, the hunters were short on meat, and he, he showed up at the campfire with a load of cut wood, a couple rabbits, and a deer he had caught earlier. He, he had a quiet way about him that invited conversation. And his smile seemed to say he was interested, and he was interested, and that he was a safe man to speak with. Soon the stranger was known as helpful and thoughtful and dependable. He encouraged the slow walkers on cloudless hot days and cheered those shivering in the cold on those cold, rainy days with rain unleashed on them. In short, he became part of that traveling community. When people celebrated, so did he. When they mourned the little Beth Simmons who didn't make it, he mourned with them. And his words brought comfort to the soothed and soothed their hearts. He showed them how to get by in an area they didn't know how to eat the fruit in or find the game in. He loved playing with children and spending time with the elderly, and when he did so, and he, when he spoke with them, they heard things that were helpful. His tent seemed to be on the edge of camp, but he always was accessible to them. For as helpfulness, and as helpful as he was, he was also seen as a bit of an adjective. While the colonel and the leaders encouraged excitement about Happy Valley, because they had plans, he, he didn't share those plans as much. The man in the red shirt suspected that this traveling group might be disappointed once they got to Happy Valley. He did speak of a town on the other side of a mountain covered in clouds. A town that sounded a great deal like the Happy Valley they were seeking, but one that it was a bit further away, required a challenging and maybe risky trek over the, the now large mountains that separated them. A, a trail that would take them out of the comfort of the Happy Valley. For those that were interested, would draw maps in the sand and offer to show them how to get there. It's not easy, he would say, but it's a good place. Some of the camp listened to his counsel, and a few families, after taking specific directions, actually left the safety and took the trek over the mountains to find this place. A lot of others, though, simply ignored him and thought his ideas a bit odd found him annoying and a bit eccentric. And when they found out that these families had left the camp, it became angry that he would have encouraged them to give up the abundance of this valley. 
Colonel and his lieutenants weren't happy either, but they allowed him to stay as long as he didn't talk about the, leaving the group. The man continued to encourage and listen and answer questions for a few more days, but then one morning his tent was gone. He no longer ate with them. He no longer shared stories. He no longer was in the midst of their daily travels. And many didn't even, even notice. He was really gone. He had moved to a trail up the ridge a little further where he could keep an eye on them as the travelers moved. But he wasn't part of them every day. But every so often he did show up, encouraging conversations and questions. And raising the inevitable one, is this the path you really want to be on? Because I can point you to another one. And some would listen. Eventually, as the valley petered out and the caravan arrived at their destination, they found themselves on a large, dusty, windswept plain and established a town that they called Happy Valley. They built some small houses, planted crops that, that struggled, and planted trees and tried to shade, but the sun was so hot and bright they had struggled. It was not about land of milk and honey, and it was not the ideal they had expected, but, but it was fine. And they worked hard to make it all it could be. The town even became a bit of a crossroads with the occasional visitor passing on their way to to somewhere. But every so often a man with long hair and a red shirt and an inviting smile would arrive at the edge of the settlement. He, he would spend a few days visiting, listening, helping as he could, and sharing an encouraging word. And he told stories about a good town he knew on the other side of a cloud-covered mountain. If any were interested, he, he'd offer to sketch a map. And then he'd ask, would you like me to help you get there? Some said yes. And so he kept asking. Our Lord comes to us. given to us by the Holy Spirit and these words that bind us together as God's people. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered at Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We are God's people and we are blessed by him. We share, return, give back cheerfully our tithes and our offerings.
come together as God's people to celebrate this wondrous event that binds us together, to remember the events of that Last Supper, and to participate in that Supper, which is ongoing from now until the ends of the ages. We participate in this communal meal with all God's people on earth and in heaven. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to the disciples and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to the disciples and he said, This cup is the blood of the New Testament, shed for you and for the forgiveness of all your sin. As often as you drink it, this do in remembrance of me. And celebrate the meal of our Lord together. I invite you to come up, and if you would like grape juice, be on this side, and if you'd like wine, be on this side. If you'd like to sip from the cup, we welcome you to do that. If you would like to dip it in the cup, in tinction, we invite you to do that as well. Come up as you are comfortable doing so. Welcome to the Lord's Table.
our Lord calls us to share each other's burdens, to be transparent in our lives with each other in ways that we can support and know each other, and to help help each other to see how God is working in our lives. Let's bring our prayers to the Lord. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your presence on this earth and all that you left here. And for your presence in heaven and your heart for us. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence today in each of us and for your work encouraging and listening. For the visitation you have with us, just be with us. We thank you for your gentleness and your heart and how you are working to change us. Lord, we are people who struggle with brokenness and despair or sadness. We are people who celebrate, and we know that you're with us in all those moments. Please hear those events that are part of our lives now that we share, gratefully knowing that you listen to us. Thanksgiving for 39 years of marriage. Lord, thank you for the connection you made 39 years ago. Tomorrow was only 38. We thank you for the blessing of marriage and for Kent and Barbara and their celebration of that time. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your Spirit, thank you for the inspiration and perspiration you have allowed these graduates to put forth. May they be to your glory and to your benefit. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we are people filled with prayer. Sometimes we remember them, sometimes we don't. Sometimes on Wednesday morning or Friday afternoon or late Saturday night, we recall things that, that we want to bring to you. We thank you for being there in all those times and hearing us. We bring you our prayers and our praises, knowing you hear us, and we are bold to pray the words that your Son gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for our And now leave this place this morning, this gathering of God's called out ones that we are all privileged to be a part of. Leave it with his blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious.